I'm very happy to um, welcome um, Dr. Costas Bekas. Um, he actually recently joined Citadel Securities, um, where he's leading the quantitative development. So he has left IBM very recently. However, we'll still talk about the work he actually did at IBM before. Before that, he was a distinguished research staff member and manager for Foundations of Cognitive Systems at IBM Research in Zurich, and was responsible for foundational research in the fields of scalable AI systems and new computing paradigms. He focused on the use of AI for the advancements of um, technical R&D, which combines knowledge extraction and representation, AI-based modeling of physical systems with large-scale numerical simulations to accelerate scientific discovery. Costas uh, uh, got his PhD under um, Professor Stratus Galopoulos in Patras in 2003. Um, he, after that, he was uh, with Professor Yusuf Saad in Minneapolis until 2005, and then he joined IBM, and now he's, as I said before, with Citadel Securities. Um, he did win several prestigious awards. He had several best paper awards, and he won the Praise Award in 2012, and the ICM, ACM Gordon Bell Prize in 2013 and 2015. So please welcome with me um, Dr. Costas Beckers. Thank you very much, Ulrike. Okay, so really great for me to come back and see so many familiar faces. It's been a few years since I'm at this great conference. Always, always feel like home when coming back to Siam PP, really, I have to say that. So many thanks, George, and the colleagues that invited me, give me the opportunity to discuss some of the work that I have been uh, doing for the several of the past years with IBM. But also I have to say that it's uh, the same spirit of work that I believe it's cross-cutting in many industries um, uh, and many disciplines. That is uh, that we are with our back on the wall on several of our classic way of doing R&D, and the new way of doing things should combine modeling, as we saw in the previous talk, data analytics in classic numerical simulation, but also the knowledge that we have all accumulated. This is something that I have seen working very well in many industries and definitely the new one that I'm now in and uh, that to my surprise is all about mathematics every day long. Uh, I think it will have a big, a big influence there. Now, uh, again, this is work that right now is happening uh, at IBM, more than 150 permanent researchers working on the problem. Uh, but also I have to, to say that there is also, I see that with, with, with satisfaction in many other companies and many universities start to have kind of the same ideas. Okay. So, I don't have to preach this to you guys. Three pillars of uh, technical R&D and all of the progress essentially that you've, we've had for the last millennia, but also especially for the last 50, 60 years, is uh, theory, experimentation and simulation, especially in the last 50, 60 years with Moore's law, um, simulation became the thing, something that is really helpful for us. However, you will see also that in the middle, let's see if the signs, yeah, I have put a little typhoon symbol here. So I want to symbolize disruption by that. And here's the basic message of all of this talk, what's going to follow for the next minutes. In every basic area here, we are with our back on the wall. Number one, last year, let's take a subject. Last year, in material science alone, there was half a million publications. Who's going to read that? It became intractable for any organization to follow up with what is happening in the knowledge domain right now. You will tell me, yeah, most of it is garbage. How do you know where to find the garbage and where to find the good stuff? Recent studies have shown that even at science or nature, less than five or three percent of the papers stand the test of time. So, so long if you just go ahead and look at the top, so-called top journals, right? So there are hidden gems everywhere. Think of Strasser's algorithm and many, many examples we have from the past. If you go to other domains like the medical domain or biological domain, okay, that is really skyrocket, it's in the millions. And if you combine that with how many products we have out there, how many software packages, Okay, look at GitHub, public GitHub, it's exploding. By the way, in knowledge, I also consider the lines of code. That's also knowledge for me, okay? So, 
this is really completely intractable with standard practices, right? I remember when Stratus, Stratus was telling me, go to the library every week, and I was telling him, well, I won't tell him you're crazy. I can have everything online, but I couldn't, right? Not to him. And then I told you, and then to Yusuf told me, we have a very good library at, in Minneapolis, but uh, yeah, you can do that online. He was a little bit ahead uh, in that respect. When I, when I, 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 I told naively, five years ago, one of my grad students back in IBM, uh, she was going to deep learning on auto tuning deep learning. Every week, let's see what's, uh, what's happening. Costa, you're crazy. There is 300 papers that come out every week on the subject. Okay? So, I hope convince you on that one. Now, for the experimentation, the data simulation, it's even tougher. Um, there is, for instance, there is several big chemical companies that are generating something like 40,000 chemical reactions per day, robotically. And this is going to go one order of magnitude more. There's now automated chemical reactors you can buy that are going to do something like a million synthesis per month on one machine. Imagine that. Imagine how much data this, this produces. So what I want to say is that our capacity to compute or analyze this data is falling behind massively. Some people, of course, now there's Jim Tsilikovsky, will tell you that this is uh, something that they knew from the 70s already, right? So Jim worked for Exxon many years back. And uh, I think the tape and the compute you had there was not, uh, the data you had was not really computable, right? <laughs> exactly. So. And, and, and let's look here. Um, okay, uh, Moore's law is, go, is, is still there, right? So we, di we did seven nanometers. We know how to do three nanometers. Um, maybe, th maybe one nanometer is possible. Uh, yield, of course, is not very nice. It goes down, so things become very expensive. But at the bottom line, well, three mil is over, right? You have to parallelize stuff. And we saw the previous very nice talk how difficult it is to parallelize stuff and to model things and to how to move forward. Okay, and uh, I tell you that that I have done some parallelization in my life so far, but essentially this is uh, a very, 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 very difficult problem right now. This is why there is so much investment into exotic new types of computing. Think quantum, okay? If you see how much money goes into quantum, you will say these guys are crazy, but they are putting the money, okay? Analog, neuromorphic type of computing, in-memory computing, memory state computing, all kinds of new types of of computing. So in terms of, uh, of processing, this is good for research and development. In California alone, you will find at least 40 very nice startups with new designs of processors. That's a first since many, many years. Okay? But this shows you that the classic way of doing things is, 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 is falling behind. Now, I have witnessed this in several situations. Um, for instance, this is an example of a molecular dynamics for studying lithium air batteries. On the right side, you see uh, what is uh, nothing else than a perfect uh, strong scaling. Uh, all the way, that's on the, on, the, on the Sequoia system, all the way to 6.3 million threads here. Time to solution, you see how it goes down. And with this simulation, we were able to find w why essentially lithium air uh, batteries are not recharging. And then the culprit was some problem with classic solvents, like electrolytes. And then naively, I said to myself, oh, we solved the problem. But you, we didn't solve the problem when we found what was the problem. We have to find the electrolyte that actually doesn't break down. So I came back to ask my people back in Zurich. I mean, I had a team of 50 people, most of them chemists. How fast can we come up with a new material following the classic approach, right? Think, simulate, think, simulate. And they told me maybe 10 years if we're lucky, and this was devastating. It was a big blow. So then I realized uh, that Amdahl's process holds everywhere, even, where, even in classic processes. Right, so Joe Amdahl, IBM engineer, back, uh, mainframe engineer back in the 60s, he said something very simple. Well, your ultimate scalability is limited by the percentage of your code that is inherently serial, like trivial, right, but, but pervasive. And this actually holds in all processes. For instance, how do we do R&D for this problem? Some guy would read a bunch of papers, maybe patents, would have discussions with the colleagues, come up with some ideas what molecules to study, for instance. We'll do a humongous parametric study of that, right? that people call that fitting. And we'll do a bunch of simulations to come back to find that nothing works. 
and repeat the cycle, and repeat the cycle, and repeat the cycle. Every now and then, there is the effect of serendipity. You read some strange paper from some other domain, get some idea by accident, and say, ha, I have it. So that is the serendipity effect that we want to eliminate, right? So the Amdahl's part here is really this thing, really. How do you systematically understand what you are going to simulate? In this community, often we focus on matrices, and we don't focus on where these matrices come from. Okay? So, and this is one thing that uh, Nick Terfetten taught me. If you have something of a very, very difficult matrix, probably you have asked the wrong problem or the wrong question, okay? So, uh, the examples uh, like that are everywhere. I'm not going to pay more time there, but we've seen it in, in, uh, in uh, computational fluid dynamics. We have seen the same problems in geophysics and on and on and on, I have seen it in physics. Basically, it's pervasive now everywhere. Drug design, molecular understanding, chemistry, materials, even biosciences, everywhere. The same kind of problems we face. Okay. Now, uh, going back to Moore's law, this is what I was telling you, uh, that we are going strong. I just stopped a couple of years back, four years back, but you see this is even a super low uh, kind of scale. So that's going well, but that's not speed. So speed is what happened here. The main reason is that we make this, the transistor so small now that if we drive them with less voltage, and it was smaller voltage that runs frequency, not size. Size drives voltage, voltage drives frequency, okay? But since 15 years now, we cannot drive the frequency anymore because we just leak current. So what did we do? Already very early on, we came up with systems that were multi-core, multi-node, multi-whatever, right? So here, at some point, we have the blue genes appearing, and then we went to GPU systems and blah, 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 blah. But I, I, I deliberately stopped this plot here early on because I want to show you some effect that empirically was understood already very early on. Look at this line. This line was very hard to compute. I think it came out of Jack, and my, my colleague Petros Komotsakos worked a lot to get this kind of estimation here. But this comes from average workload performance on many of the HPC centers around the world, including the US and Europe, and some in, uh, and I think, I think also uh, Satoshi has some numbers here. But the bottom line is that, uh, um, yes, the average, average application performance was always a fraction of the peak performance of the machine. But it was kind of like a parallel slope, right? Machine better, average performance increases. Machine better, average performance increases, right? So that was justifying. But already when we started the multi-core, the very, very difficult parallelization uh, problems, then we start to see the average application performance really performing a gap between what you could do in, the, in, in reality and what was that? Because we replaced the problem of waiting two years to get a faster chip, increase the frequency, with some grad student or some engineer writing parallel code. The second is much, much more difficult. Okay. That's the bottom line. Now, in the meantime, something else has been happening. The big data world discovered high performance computing. So if you see the workloads that we have in, in, in big data analytics, in machine learning, in even large scale statistics, in, and if you look at the computational requirements and the data requirements, do you say, hey, I'd like to run that on my supercomputer? And lo and behold, most of the Gordon Bell uh, uh, papers in the last uh, five years, they had the term deep learning in their title, right? So. This is another realization. So I, I, I just wanted to paint for you the, oh, by the way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to forget this. This is the number of papers published, if you don't believe me, published in material science every year. This is not cumulative, it's every year. And you can see how it increases massively. We started from a few tens of papers, about 35,000, all the way to 400, 500,000 now, right? Okay. So that paints the picture, essentially, that we have to deal with a massive amount of data that is highly, highly, highly unstructured. We cannot expect that our compute is enough to deal with the structured data, so much for the unstructured. Our mind is not enough to design what are the best simulation inputs. We need some automation in that respect. That's the bottom line. So let's look at, take a look at the classic way of doing things. Classic way of doing things goes, like, goes as follows. You start with some ideas. 
So I visit Tami, for instance, we discuss some problems on tensors. And in my head, I say, hey, I could use that in um, financial analysis, for instance, right? Serendipity, because we came, we discussed. How many people can I discuss with? It's about 70, 80 people. Like, this is a cognitive barrier, actually. It's, it's proven with studies. You should look at some studies from the 50s and 60s psychologists. They are the, this, this kind of, it's like a, a memory <laughs> hierarchy problem. You can see how performance goes down with size of people that you have to interact, okay? Also, this is why there are some other studies now that show, like in social networks, this is why similar people find similar people. You know, I like. It kind of how say, breaks this uh, cognitive barrier, okay? So you could start with what you, what you know, what you can discuss, uh, what you can think while taking a shower, for instance. And then what we have been doing is using computational experimentation. We fan out. We create a lot and a lot and a lot of examples in the universe, and then we pick one. And oh, many of you here will say, hey, we are scientists. We're not going to, we're not doing things right uh, in just in random order. I assure you that this is the standard way that things are done in the industry. Especially in, for instance, in protein design, design of materials, design of structures, that's the way. Because that engineering way is predictable. You can actually tell to a manager, it's gonna, it's gonna take two months, it's gonna cost that many dollars. And this is what they need to know, okay? Remember, it's the economics that really drive the things. It's not the science that drive the things there. Now, what I told you is that this little triangle anymore now has to deal with millions of papers, so they will not fit. <laughs> this uh, trapezoid here is a simulation. Uh, it's, it cannot track with all of the data that we're generating. So essentially, this world right now, it became infinite, so it is the bottleneck. So we have to change it. And the way to change it, it's, it's, if you think about it, it's very simple and trivial. We, every day we are bombarded with, uh, with, with advancements in deep learning, in machine learning, meaning that in, in, in general with statistical learning, I don't, we'll not, never call it AI because it's not, but with statistical learning, right? So with enough compute and with enough data, you can actually find very difficult patterns in this data. I will tell you, I will show you examples of how now we have technologies that can actually read the data in papers. They can read the diagrams, they can read the tables, and they can extract this data and organize it. So suddenly you don't have to read all of these papers. They are read for you by machines. Or that now we have, thanks to all of this data, we can have surrogate models to simulation. So instead of doing an expensive simulation, you're going to do some sort of surrogate to that one it's like, again, nothing, nothing new. Many people here know model reduction, I'm sure. It's another way of doing model reduction. A little bit not so organized, but very powerful. Okay, so you reduce the dimension of the problem. But again, I want, to think, I, want, I want you guys to think a little bit for one second. Why, what are we doing with the results of a simulation? What are we really doing with it? I argue that in the end, that falls into a classification problem by default. I do a simulation to understand whether the flow of a certain airfoil is adequate or not. Adequate or not. Or into which category it falls. Category A, category B, category C. It's a classification problem. Why? Because we are doing simulations to make decisions. Decision support can always be done like a classification problem. So this is why these things fit very well. So use all of the data in our favor, use the latest advances we have in AI to read, to organize the data, and come up here, for instance, with knowledge objects, such as large-scale knowledge graphs, think like uh, the internet, but now the internet of all of the papers, but not just the papers, but really the data in the papers. Everything interconnected, okay? Then uh, use HPC and advanced graph analytics algorithms and approximation to come up with um, to come up with a way to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to further reduce what you're going to simulate. For instance, um, we started with two million materials for uh, electrolytes out of the open crystallography database. Through the AI-driven approach, we reduced that down to something like uh, uh, 50,000. So the 50,000, uh, only, only, only those. Further, Deep learning uh, processing reduced that down to about 
uh, 100. Okay, 100 simulations I can do in a year. Two million simulations I cannot do in a year. So that approach actually allowed my team to find a couple of electrolytes at the pace of, uh, new electrolytes at the pace of four months, every four months. And that, that is uh, at least a couple of orders of improvement in the discovery phase that we had. Okay, so what do you need? You need technologies that will ingest knowledge, complicated knowledge. You need organization so that it's going to give you some sort of deep search, so their graphs become hugely important. And then you need the technologies that will are, are going to tell you what are the most interesting simulations to do and what should be the order. So in this case, Bayesian inference plays a very, very, very big role. So, so like experiment design. Again, many of these things are not new, but they are really systematically put together. So, for instance, in, um, in, in, uh, in many cases, um, we, the enemy was uh, working with PDF documents. That's the way how people communicate in science today. They just share PDF documents. PDF is very good, very portable, but it's very bad to construct or to hold any, <laughs> any meta information inside, so you have to invert it. Then advanced natural language processing that can actually understand the numerics of what is being told in a paper, like uh, uh, this material was uh, homogenized at 900 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours. You have to extract the 900, the 24, you have to put them together, and you have to link them with what was that material, okay? And, and then in the end, advanced graph analytics, and there is a lot of work on, on actually sparse linear algebra, uh, with respect to computing things such as subgraph node centralities, graph simplification, graph sparsification, lots and lots and lots of linear algebra on sparse graphs, so these sparse computations are very important in that respect to compute, uh, to compute things um, uh, about better, better, better search, but also uh, other things become very, very important there, such as, uh, such as tuning, auto-tuning for deep learning, uh, basically, you need a lot of technologies that are going to remove uh, the redundant work and put that to machines. Okay, so overall, we came up with, uh, with the research program, and there's hundreds of people now working on this one. You have at the bottom knowledge extraction and representation. You have uh, uh, inference-driven simulations, and hopefully towards the top, we're going to go to some form of assisted or automated reasoning. Now, at the bottom, very bottom, you have ingestion of documents. Then you have no domain-specific knowledge graphs, domain-specific machine learning. I'll show you examples of domain-specific machine learning. Natural language querying. We are experimenting on the full indices. are experimenting whether scientists will actually like to communicate with systems in, in kind of oral terms. Like, I write, imagine I write down an equation and the system should be able to tell me all of the papers that something similar like that is being used, okay? Or your ideas that are similar are being used there. Okay, the, towards the top, it's mostly, okay, fantasy land. The most interesting thing is automated hypothesis discovery. Uh, there is a lot of work in that respect with some that's called knowledge graph completion, for instance. So. If I, comp if I have, imagine I have two pieces of information that have never been studied together. Think of a very simple example. I have some cylinder um, geometry of, uh, now we're speaking about telecombustion engines, and some valve geometry, and nobody has studied that together, so you will not find that link in your knowledge graph, okay? But if you were to put a hypothesis, like would these things work together, okay? Then it's like assuming something. I assume that this and that would work all together. Do, do me an experiment, right? Do me an experiment may mean spend $500,000. So you'd better be sure that that hypothesis is a good one, okay? So what would we do? We'd do a simulation instead of doing the real one. A simulation is not expensive. It's not that cheap anymore, right? So what if we put some graph analytics instead? What if we say, well, if I assume a hypothesis, the answer is that if that hypothesis is to change the importance of everything else in the graph, it must be something interesting. Otherwise, drop it, okay? So think, 
so that we start to add edges on these graphs, hypothesis for instance, we see what would be the would-be effect. It could be bogus, not real, but if it, there is no effect, then drop it, don't do it anyway, right? And so essentially, you can have graph analytics take a million hypotheses, reduce it down to 10, and then give to the human this 10, and the human will decide in the end, okay? These are the kind of ideas that have been explored. Okay, so we, for the first part, we want to go all the way from documents all the way down to knowledge graphs. I'm not going to spend uh, a time there, but I want to tell you that there is definitely now technology um, that is also, I mean, came out from my team, we put it in the marketplace, uh, that, can take, that can take PDF documents and will end up with JSONs. Uh, there you will have uh, the text, the formulas, the diagrams, the, the tables, you name it. And that you can put on your favorite DB. You can do elastic, you can put your favorite DB, whatever you want. Same for images. Uh, and we have applied that in, in many, many ideas. In many cases, this is for the medical domain. The idea is that you are um, just annotating a little bit. You say here, these are the paragraphs, and the system will tell you this is a table, and the columns of the table, so on and so forth. And then we use advanced, uh, super duper hierarchical random forest technologies to train on a small amount of data. And then the system then knows what is the model of a page. But that's, that's more or less how this happens. This is, now, this is now what I would say mature. Now, the interesting thing is that we took these ideas and we applied them in real large-scale industrial problems. For instance, we applied that in the design of aluminum. So you want to design new aluminum alloys. So the idea is, and we did that with several companies, the idea is that you you take laboratory data, experimental data, scientific literature, production results, you put them with the AI technology, you put them in the knowledge graphs. Through advanced graph analytics, you find similar products, similar processes. You design the simulations you need for the data that is really missing, because there will be missing data. You close the circle, and then in the end, you can do good predictions. Okay, so the problem was reduced to the following. Some customer comes, tells you, Here's what I want. How many dollars per ton do you want? Okay, that's the, uh, the, the, the real problem. The breakdown of the problem is, well, can I, do I have it? If I have it, I sell it. Can I do it if I don't have it? How many, exa how many tests do I need to do in order to design, right? So this, all this thing is designed to drive cost really down. And it, it, it really works. So I, have, I had some examples here, uh, for instance, uh, here we are looking at all of the literature and we're looking at all of the patents that uh, mention copper or tensile yield strength. This is kind of a search, right? Nobody read these papers, this was all automatic. Now we want to say, show us all the materials, all the products that have zinc and their ultimate tensile strength, right? So now you can do this kind of correlation analysis that will have taken you years and years to put in DBs. You can do them through automatic AI. Now we say I want to design a product. I'm going to put zinc between a certain center percent, seven and ten percent, and predict the other properties. Right? For instance, we're going to ask something like, uh, "Tell me about uh, elongation," and this will do you predictions about elongation. All this without any simulation, only on the data that has been extracted. Okay? And then, and then you can go on and on and can do and, and you do this. Now. Okay, this may look a little bit more heuristic, but can we, can we take this approach and can we actually teach it something that is fundamentally very, very, very difficult? Could we teach it organic chemistry? In many cases, in many, many uh, applications in organic chemistry, I cannot even do the simulations. They are they're out of scope. I cannot do them, okay? So in general, chemistry is difficult to simulate, Jim will tell you. You need to go to seconds of simulations, not to nanoseconds, okay? Could an approach like this, where we have extracted data, uh, could an approach like that can uh, be used? So instead of showing you slides here, I think I have a, I have a system, so you can, you, can all, you can all try that system. It's called IBM RxN. If anybody knows a little bit of organic chemistry here, you can go, it is free, you can go. Just type IBM RxN on your favorite, on your favorite um, uh, search engine, let's, is, I understand it's not there because, like this. 
So, so let me go over there. I think I think we're here. Um, so let me take one of the, one one project here. So the idea is to let me show you something. So the idea is that you uh, tell the system, show me, uh, I give you this molecule, this molecule, and this molecule, and I can even I can even show it a little bit more detail. Let's go there inside. Okay, hopefully this will this will come right. So you can use this canvas, or you can read from DBs. You will uh, put these three molecules, and now you ask the system that has been trained using translation kind of models from deep learning predict me the result of the reaction, what's going to happen, okay? So now we can just, now this is a live system on the cloud. Oh, I said the random two synthesis that was not good. What I wanted, oh, sorry about this. What I wanted was to go here, just give me 10 seconds and we'll come back. So what I wanted to do uh, oh, here. What I wanted to do was to show you the forward prediction, because we also have the backward, also the, the retrosynthesis. And I'll just give me a second. I will do it. Okay. So I will run our RAM prediction. So it will take these molecules. It will run a, a deep learning system, the inference right now, but it will also compute an explanation. So what you see on the left side, on the right side here, is what we call an attention matrix. It's the input string, the output string. Uh, chemistry is all about strings, actually. You can write it down. And this heat map will tell you which part of which molecule start, which part of the molecule start to start with which other part of the molecule. It's like the kernel of the reaction. Okay, so it will give you an explanation. Now, this system right now is 93% accurate. It takes 25 years of experience for anybody in the world to become about 75% accurate. Okay, so. Uh, when we sold that to the ACS uh, uh, big congress in Boston, like a year and a half ago, everybody was really amazed. Now, the other thing is that you can do the retrosynthesis. I'm not going to do that now because it takes more time, of course. Um, there, you take uh, uh, a molecule and you tell it, okay, give me all of the change of reactions that are required to build it. Okay. Now, the details there are enormous, but I will tell you that it's all based on Bayesian inference a large scale traversal of very large scale graphs. So again, graph algorithms, sparse linear algebra is the key of how we were able to make that happen, okay? So I decided a little bit, just show you a little bit of higher, higher dimensions today of how this thing could be used. But since we are at a mathematical conference, I want to show you how, where, all this, or where all this stuff is really based on. Okay, so let's go there. Now, basically, a lot of the a lot of the algebra that is behind in trying to get these graphs, simplify the graphs, compare the graphs, um, make decision support, do deep learning on the graphs is all about computing matrix functions on graphs. And this is start start something that uh, I mean, I first was uh, introduced to that by Yusuf Saad and Jim Zelikovsky back 15 years ago from uh, density functional theory. There, the function is essentially how do you estimate the diagonal of a projector? The projector is what will put you to the occupied space of your orbitals, okay? Of course, then later on when I moved on, I realized that um, density matrices are not only, you not only found them in DFT or, or in density functional theory or in condensed matter physics, but they're almost everywhere in this respect. And then I found out that that matrix functions play a greater role. For instance, minimize V transpose AV is page rank. Okay, the simplest form of a matrix function, right? Quadratic. Okay, diagonal of E to the A is subgraph node centralities. Diagonal of the resolvent of the matrix, A minus Z inverse, is spectral centralities. And these are much, much more powerful algorithms than page rank to do analysis on graphs. We never use them. Why? They scale like number, they scale at n to the cube. Even for space matrices, this will be dense things. Okay? Other applications. 
get the inverse of a covariance matrix. That's a precision matrix. This is used a lot in, you name it, in designs of, of experiments, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, covariance analysis, partial variance analysis everywhere, right? So this kind of matrix functions. So, so a lot of the algebra is, is, uh, is, 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 actually, uh, is actually there. And there we are using uh, the good old things from approximation theory means that uh, if, I, if I have a closed form for any type of matrix function, then uh, I don't need to compute the, the coefficients of my stable shift expansions. Otherwise, I go back to things like quadrature. I go to back to things like uh, 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 integration in lines. Basically, any matrix function can be written down like the Danforth-Taylor formula which means that you can compute any matrix function by just solving linear equations. That's the bottom line. Okay, so we come back to square one. Very large scale, big sparse matrices. When you solve linear equations, what it is, sparse matvec, like the previous talk, right? In the end, it's all the same. In the end, it's all the same. This is why you have to master these things. But now in new environments, like on the cloud, like, like with these things that we have difficulties, okay? So, what are we doing? Uh, oh, so something else also. Do you really need 15 digits of accuracy? That's the other thing you have to ask yourself. In the end, it's a classification problem, right? So this means that I will have to be able to compute with enough accuracy the stuff that on top of this, of which I'm going to make some decisions with enough accuracy so that my decisions are stable. So in the end, it's a little bit like multigrid. You need a couple of digits of accuracy in the end. That's what you need, okay? So then the trick is to understand how much you're going to trade computation with accuracy. This is why this framework of uh, stochastic approximation of metric functions is really very cool in this respect, okay? But it entails some form of uh, a little bit of, a, of, of an empirical uh, kind of factor, okay, so you need to, okay, you need to know, okay, how much is going to, how many are going to be the terms of my tables of expansion? Uh, 16 enough, uh, 32 enough, 64 enough, or whatever, right? So we still don't grasp completely automatically this kind of things, but we're going there. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip that, but in the interest of time, I think I have five minutes. Yeah, so for the last part, I want to tell to, 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 to go also now, to the last, to the last uh, big villain, right? So what are we doing for the hardware right now? I think I covered what we're doing for data, what we're doing for experimentation, what we're doing for reducing complexity. Let's go back to the hardware now. Okay. So, there is essentially nothing nonlinear that we solve. We always solve something that's linear. If, if something is nonlinear, we linearize it. Okay? Now, so in the end, this is why even matrix functions or PDEs or whatever result to solving linear systems in the end, okay? Even, okay, slightly nonlinear, like I give you problems, but I would call them their cousins, you see, okay, in that respect. So I was thinking several years back that when computing was not very stable, Wilkinson came with the idea of iterative refinement. The idea was, uh, I don't have a very good floating point, so I have errors all the time. So if I repeat, like kind of, I have inaccurate computation, but I can get an accurate computation of my residual, then I can repeat that, right? So essentially this means, give me a gross approximation, maybe by some deep learning system, whatever, okay? Compute the residual, that is one order of magnitude less cost, that's the key solve inaccurately for that residual, put the result back into your solution, and this converges. That's iterative refinement. Converges beautifully. Indeed, it's been in the LAPAC since many, many, many years just to improve the quality. In recent years, however, saw a new type of hardware. They saw GPUs that have now single precision, yes, but they have half precision, for instance, and half precision can be 16 times faster than single precision, or than, than double precision. So what if I do the majority of my computations in this half precision, like compute uh, your Cholesky decompositions in half precision, if you want to, to invert the covariance matrix, right? 
and then the residuals are computed in high precision, and then the full result in the end is high precision. Okay? Then you ask yourself, well, why not, why only half precision? Why not less? Why not do ASICs for 8 bit precision or for, why not do FPGA? So, so uh, I've been doing that for several years and with many other colleagues around the world. Jack's team has been working massively on that one and many, many teams in Europe. I know teams in France, teams in Germany. They are looking to this combination of exact and inexact computing to come up to exact results. And in general, think of an architecture that is kind of like this. You have some reliable compute low load, reliable memory, low traffic, and then the vast of the computations are happening on non-reliable or erroneous or kind of noisy with even errors in communication, non-reliable memory, whatever, but with high traffic. Even the communication can be a little bit inexact, but the result here overall becomes very accurate. So does it really work? Huh? It, 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 it works beautifully. This is a real example from inverting and working with inverse, with covariance matrices, with precision matrices from data analytics. Basically, the improvement is this one. You go from 103 kilojoule to 0 0.3 kilojoule. That's not five or 10 or 20 percent, that's 300. Okay? This, is, this realization gave also ground to many uh, architectures that are people are working today. Some of the latest ones I want to show you are the ones that try to use this idea of computational memory. So post von Neumann or semi post von Neumann. You want to do the computation in the same device as where you have your memory. Okay. And again, let me do that in the interest of time to, to skip most of the stuff, but what I want to show you is that there is a bunch of devices, they are called memoristic devices, a bunch of types of semi-amorphous to fully amorphous materials that become fully amorphous when you just randomize them, so they are in a natural state, and when you run pulses through them of electricity, they become semi-structured. So this means that they can count. If I have a counter, I can design an adder. With a counter and an adder, I can do whatever I want. That's the bottom line in compute, right? So people came up with um, several papers now. Um, let me skip that. They came up with uh, um, memoristic arrays that can do matrix vector communication, simply applying Kirchhoff's laws there. And the cost of that is essentially order one. Order one. That's it. So if you have, for instance, your sparse matrix event, and it doesn't change because it's some discontinuation of PD or whatever, you could burn it there, and that would be order one cost, even to do it. The catch, the catch is that these are analog computing. The catch is that there is a thermal drift. So the catch is that they are going to be not so accurate, right? Maybe a couple of digits. You have to repeat them several times. But they cost nothing, nothing in running. So can we do actually something useful? So I put that technology down with a bunch of colleagues in IBM, and we designed a PCG method uh, where all of the matvex uh, were, were happening on this memoristic device on a chip, and then the rest was happening offline on, on, a, on a reliable hardware, um, and the result is very nice. So it scales. Uh, all the way beautifully to getting down the, the, the same problem the previous for data analytics goes all the way down to, uh, to reduction of six orders of magnitude of the residuals. Um, and you can really, it was the first time that we proved in practice that you can solve linear systems on these types of problems. That was in nature communications, nature electronics last year. Okay. And of course, people will do even more exotic stuff. They will start to do neuromorphic type of computing, or they will do, let me go to the next one, or they will do quantum computing, right? That's these two slides just to show you how extremely people are going towards the last blob, which is the computation. Okay. So all in all, we believe that we need a systematic approach to attack the complexity we have today. AI can really help us, machine learning can really help us get all the data in, or at least much of it. Advanced graph uh, algorithms and linear algebra on graphs can actually help us sort through, through this. Advanced machine learning technologies can actually help us replace the vast majority of the would-be simulations so that I can focus on doing well very small number of simulations which I can afford. 
and then at the end repeat the cycle and go to faster design. Does it work? It's work proven. We have applied that in several industries, and I think this is going to be definitely a part of the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you described the situation in material science in which there is a massive human effort to do experiments and write papers that are readable, that have graphs and diagrams that explain to other humans, and then another human effort to review the papers, decide whether they're accepted, and then they're all ingested by machines. Is the, what's, what's going to happen to the process of writing papers if they're going to be ingested by machines? That's a very good question. And this is, it gives me the opportunity to answer, uh, to, to give my opinion on something that's very important. There is no AI in any of these things. These are all statistical ma machines. So if you don't give them good quality data, they go nowhere. So this means that we have to keep working and to keep developing and to keep putting our brain there to come with the best ideas. The systems are helpers. You can write a very nice paper. The community collectively can write a very, very, very nice, very nice papers. The community collectively cannot, however, put all the knowledge in one place. So we use machines to do that. That's the way to look at it. It's, it's an instrument. Nothing like that. I don't believe in automatic writing and all of these things. No, this is, or even guns, no. no. Thank you, Kostas. You already um, kind of Peter. answered my question. So um, you mentioned that a significant portion of the papers out there is garbage. And I'm not sure whether this is true or not, but assuming that more than half of the papers are garbage, this will not give us any useful answer, right? No, not really, because half of uh, 1.5 million is still 750,000. Yeah, but okay. how, will, uh, how but, will AI detect? I mean, but we let, let, me, let me tell you something uh, how about, uh, how about in, this, in, this, uh, in, this, in this in this point. I'm a person that believes that, uh, yes, of course, there is complete garbage out there, okay, but it's easy. To, to, to find it. By the way, uh, I think in NIPS this year or in ICML they're going to implement this, or next year, automatic reviewing of garbage papers. <laughs> you can imagine that? It's going to be in practice. It's, it's, it's there, okay? So, still, even in the papers that are half-baked or whatever, I want to remind you guys the, 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 the em empirical hypothesis, right? So if something is not even, I mean, we believe too much in p-values in all of these things. If I observe something, right, and I keep observing it, but okay, I don't have that many computations, this must mean something, okay? So the paper will be rejected as garbage because it does not follow the, the practices, but then the data collectively is, is very good. So for instance, if I had a jar with pearls here, right, maybe 5,500 pearls, and I ask every single one of you guys to tell me what's the number of pearls here? Somebody would say 10,000, somebody 50,000, somebody 50. When we do the average of that, the collective of that will be about 5,010. If you have not seen this phenomenon, I urge you to see that. So when we put data collectively in mass, something nonlinear happens in that respect. There is a massive effect that has been observed. That's what I want to say. That's the, the person of it. So the garbage will be, think, garbage, garbage, cancel out, <laughs> okay? Yeah, okay, last question. <laughs> Sorry. So to, to work, you, you agree that you need to publish every failed experiment too, else everybody will do the same hypothesis and start again and again. So normally you should publish everything. So I, think, I think that's, that's okay, you, you have a very good point there. So let, let, me, let me put it down the following way. Who publishes failure? Nobody. No one, right? I will tell you that companies have a very big interest to keep failure inside, okay? Now, also universities have the failure inside. It's in the drawer of some PhD student, but it's always there because you did it, okay? If we had a systematic way to catalog what we did, then we could search into that failure. Something else I want to tell you. When you have all of this knowledge, the published knowledge, then the success, if you will, right? You have it in analyzed in graphs, then these graphs algorithms can find you where you have gaps in the knowledge, wide areas. And there are two reasons to have essentially wide areas. Either somebody tried it and, and, and failed, so they don't publish, 
or, or people didn't do it. Okay, so it's a really genuine white space. Of course, there's a little bit of a nuance in the first one. Somebody tried it, they didn't publish because they failed or because it was too good and they want to keep for themselves. Okay, that's also the secret sauce sometimes. So if we, my argument is that if we go to a systematic way to ingest and catalog what we are doing, then things become possible, even if you don't publish them. You can encrypt them and you can send them to the world, you can do a lot of stuff. I have just a little question. I, I believe that your system is really wonderful, and so you, the database, the AI, and the graph system should be uh, sold to the new scientific journals uh, that will manage it. And so the question is when IBM will sell it to, to the journal, so at least the publishers, they Yeah, can, so this, they is, a, a, this is, again, a good point in that respect. So. I generally believe that we are moving towards a very new way of doing publishing, right? So I cannot speak anymore for IBM, but so I speak for Costas Beckers right now. Um, definitely you start to see that even publishers start to go towards a model of knowledge than a model of printing or a model of giving you electronic copies, okay? So everybody realizes that the value is not really in giving you an access to a copy or whatever, but the value is in extracting the knowledge. And if publishers start to realize that, which is uh, you know, counter to their, uh, if you will, business game, so there is hope in that direction. What we should do as scientists is to work with our societies, like SIAM, ACS, ACM, everybody to go towards this direction. We should demand it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>